Hi, this is Carrie, and welcome to Tandem Talks, a podcast meant to empower you to live your life your way. And I'm Craig. Join us as we go deeper with entrepreneurs and their journey creating success in business and life. Welcome, everybody, to the Tandems Talk podcast. We are super honored to have Steve Bolin House out of the Twin Cities, Minnesota, with us here today. And he has a very extensive background and an interesting one. He actually started out as a meteorologist up in the Minneapolis area, but over time in the late 80s, actually segued into being a CEO of Weatherology. And that really was founded on a passion for distributing local weather information. And he's now up to 1,200 different stations accessing Weatherology, which is incredibly impressive. And some things that he probably won't tell you directly, but I'm going to break for him, is he's won several Emmy Awards for um, within the science and programming industry. Um, He he holds a prestigious AMS seal of approval from the American Meteorological Society. That's no small feat. Uh, He's got an awesome podcast called The Anatomy of Success, as well as a book and a weatherology app, which I've recently downloaded, and it is amazing. I'm um, also a motivational speaker and has a massive presence on social media. So, Steve, we just appreciate you being on. We're really excited to dig into your story. Mm-hmm. And the place that I want to start is just finding out more about, like, the heart of your medi- meteorology interest and how you got into the weather industry altogether, you know, early on in, in the beginning. So, can you speak to that a little bit? And welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. That introduction was amazing. So you did get the check. I just wanted to make sure it yeah. cleared. So that's fantastic. And you did omit inadvertently that I walk on water too. So we should throw that in there. I was going to say that at the end. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're that's, that. it's, it's not that impressive that it's Minnesota in January, though, Steve. A lot of people do that. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so to get back to your question, I mean, it's a great one, Carrie. I started um, my interest in weather when I was a young uh, boy growing up in central Minnesota, uh, out in the rural country of uh, Wright County. My folks owned radio stations, so I was enamored with the, uh, the broadcasting that the local DJs were doing whenever there was severe weather. And then my friends lived on some big farms, and I'd spend a lot of time out there, and you'd see these massive uh, supercell thunderstorms roll in off the plains. And I think like all of us, it's it's awe-inspiring and it's very humbling. Yeah. And there's also a touch of fear that kind of factors into like, wow, this is so much bigger than me. So there was this desire to kind of tame that or at least provide some um, uh, perspective for people. And, and I got fascinated with that. That evolved into going off to college, studying journalism, business, and then being completely uh, captivated by the local TV meteorologist here at CARE 11. His name is Paul Douglas, became my mentor, but he's arguably the best TV weatherman I've ever, uh, you know, seen personally in my life. And there's plenty that would attest to that. And I called him up out of the blue. I said, Hey, I'd like to come over, interview you and just see, um, uh, if I can find out a bit more about what you do, I'm curious. And he was gracious enough to accept the invitation turned into a three hour conversation. And I accepted a two year, uh, I thought would be a two month, but it turned into a two year non-paid internship, which I gladly did. 40 hours a week and, uh, and um, answered phones. I'd go get his car on a rainy day, bring it up to the front so he wouldn't get wet. I mean, I went overboard, but my (laughs) point in that is that, you know, people look at that. I'd never do that. Of course you'd never do that. And of course you're never going to live the lifestyle that you want to live because you don't want to pay those dues. I get it. And um, so don't do those things and we'll see how far you get in life. And I'm pretty, you know, on LinkedIn, I'm very, um, when I deliver, I try to be appealing to everybody, but then there's a higher calling that I have where I'm encouraging people. If you really want to step up in life and have this remarkable life you want, um, you got to really try to challenge yourself to be comfortable getting very uncomfortable doing things that don't seem so obvious and use your imagination and explore some ideas that maybe aren't conventional. And so that fascination turned into me going and getting my master's degree in meteorology after that internship. And that internship led to my first job. I was sitting in the office at Paul's uh, weather studio and the phone rang and the guy in the other line said, Hey, Paul, I could hear it plain as day. I'm trying to find a meteorologist. He goes, he's right here. And if you don't hire him, I'm going to be pissed. Uh Wow. That That was my first job. Yeah. So that's where the two years of doing what nobody wants to do suddenly paid off. 
And that opportunity paved the way to get into an industry that's very incestuous and difficult to get into. And then that inspired my entrepreneurial journey. Because again, this internship led to Paul starting a business. He hired me to do the sales and manage that company. And I quickly discovered, you know what? I'm going to do this for myself. I'm making this guy a boatload of money. I'm going to go off and do my thing. We amicably parted. And I started Weatherology back in 1987. Wow. Yeah. Steve, th thanks for sharing that. There is so much to unpack there. And it plays <laughs> so well into a lot of the themes that we talk about. Um, so I, I might just call a little bit of an audible, but, but first, like, obviously you decided to, to do it yourself, you know, kind of step away from someone that you've been learning from. I mean, why, why do that? I mean, why not just stay as an employee? Like, why did you make that shift? Not everybody's willing. Um, and then maybe can you just talk a little bit about, you know, your, your mindset on, on why, but then also how you were able to do that effectively. Whereas a lot of people maybe aren't, you know, there's that, that gap, right? Where people either have that fear and they don't try or they try, but it's sort of a feigned attempt and then they're not able to really make that transition. No, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I've always had supreme confidence. I'm 5'6", 150 pounds. So I played uh, college hockey and I was a professional kickboxer and told my whole life, you're too small to play hockey. These guys are huge. And I remember when I was in 10th grade, my high school hockey coach took me aside and said, Steve, I'm... I'm, I'm talking to you privately because we believe you're good enough to play varsity. We're just concerned that your size may be a detriment. And I said, man, that's the only reason you're preventing me from playing. I said, I got good news for you. Worry about the other guys. Let's skate up and get started here, shall we? Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm not the problem here. And so they put me on the team. And uh, one day the senior that had the position that I wanted got hurt. I jumped in the lineup. The goalie who happened to be the captain of our hockey team after the first uh, time on the ice, skated over to the bench, took a time out during the game and told the coach, he goes, whatever you do, don't ever take this guy off the ice ever again because his energy and his passion are contagious. And this team desperately needs that. So those are lessons you learn in life. So the whole idea of going off on my own was not something I ever personally struggled with because I knew it was something I could easily do. Um, I also methodically spelled out to myself the best way to approach that, which for me personally was from a position of strength, gainfully being employed, build up my business until it got to a point where the income was commensurate with the comfort level I was okay with. And then I'd make the break. So this notion of all or nothing is nonsense. And people circulating this oh specious claim oh are, 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 are oh being dishonest and, and they're discouraging a lot of good people in the process from approaching this a very different way. And all the research demonstrates that actually more business Businesses succeed when they're facilitate, facilitated by people that actually have an income, a little stability, and they start a company at, uh, at a position like that. And so I'm just encouraging people that are listening that, you know, you got to be careful about the advice you get. There's this, you know, this culture we celebrate that says you got to go out, start a business, scale it up, become a billionaire. I mean, when I was running my business, it was enough, you know, let's be a millionaire. Now it's a billionaire. And I can tell you, I know a lot of billionaires that I wouldn't want to be if my life depended on it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we can talk about that later, but that's kind of a little background about how I got started. And, um, and then it got to a point where, like I said, the revenue was at a point where I just naturally made the decision to break away and go off and do my own thing. Yeah. Well, we can, we can relate to that. Carrie was able to, uh, actually step away. I think we might've lost your video there for a second, Steve. Um, but Carrie is able to step away in her mid twenties from essentially the side hustles that we built. And then I stepped away a few years ago um, from commercial banking. So we did it in a much more, uh, gradual way, you know, much more practical way almost. And uh, it's worked so well for us. And we just, it's great to hear you speak and, and talk right into that and how this binary mindset of all or nothing, like we just think that is so ridiculous as well. And it's like, people are hanging on to a job they might not love and they're not very passionate about. And then they're afraid to make the leap because it's like this huge jump when it's like, no, just take mm -hmm. a step and keep the day job. Um, so man, yeah, that does, that, that plays very much into our philosophy and what's yeah. worked for us. Not that it can't be done the other way, but, uh, it doesn't have to be totally. 
no, you're right. And, and like I said, statistically, it works more often the way you guys did it, the way I did it for people. Because the average person that wants to start a business is a bit more conservative, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with being conservative and being frugal and a little trepidatious. I mean, there is some fear associated with going off on your own. So why uh, impose on yourself some unnecessary burden predicated on self-imposed restrictions that make it even more complicated when you can say, you know what, I'm going to ease into this, which doesn't diminish the success of the outcome at all. It just says, you know, this is my path and my path is okay. And I'm okay with different paths. And quite honestly, this all or nothing path ends up creating more stress, more anxiety. And oftentimes people acquiesce with their values and principles in the process and say, you know what, let's go get that VC money. Let's go get an investment from a family member. Let's get some cash and let's pay our staff before we've generated any revenue. And let's go down that path. And again, that's part of the reason so many of these companies fail. My goal was I'm going to drive the success of my business from selling. You know, and I started selling immediately. And so that's the other thing I tell people is make sure you get really, really good at selling because that's the best way, in my opinion, to fund your own business. And to this day, I own 100% of my equity because I've never taken any outside investment despite our massive growth. And, you know, and it's beautiful when you're at a point in life where it's like, you know, I think I'm going to give equity to my chief operating officer who's been me, been with me for 35 years instead of some chump that comes in with a bad attitude and a lot of money who just wants to contaminate the culture that you've created for a long time. So you got to be really cautious, I think, as you go through this process and think ahead. Do you want to build a business that sticks around and serves as an annuity and an opportunity to cultivate remarkable talent and do something extraordinary? Or do you just want to build a business and sell it and make a boatload of money? That's one way to do it. Nothing wrong with that either. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I have so much that we could go deeper on there, but I want to give it over to Carrie to, as, as we continue to go through here. Well, and I think really what you just shared in so many ways, Steve, segues into my question is just like through getting to know you the last couple of years and through your content, I sense a very strong level of integrity and deeply principle-based and values-based, which is why I, I connect so much with what you put out. But I think as people are building businesses, there's oftentimes tough decisions and moments in trying to scale where people maybe are playing a little bit more of a short game. And I'm wondering if you have any stories of like how you've been able to stick so closely to those values for many, many years now at this point. You've built a large scale company, a huge following. How have you been able to maintain that um, throughout the process when I don't always think it's easy, but it is so vitally important? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I think it's the hardest way to build a successful business. You know, the easy way is to get outside money. And that's not easy. We all know the statistics on failure rates for businesses. And even if you get outside money, the problem with that, in my opinion, is you invite into whatever you're attempting to create the possibility, the dynamics are going to be off. And they usually are. So despite what any person with money attempts to try to convince you that, hey, I'm coming in with good intentions. I just talked to a guy at the gym last week. Steve, I should have listened to you. We brought in an outside investor. He's making my life miserable. Mm. Why? Because they want to make money. Of course they do. And so when that, and that's never been, I know this sounds cliche because you hear it, but I never, and to this day, I'm not motivated by like making a lot of money. It's just not that big of a deal. Making money is easy. You know, for some people, it's quite easy, honestly. You know, that's not the fun part. The fun part is um, hiring people, you know, recognizing talent, seeing something in somebody they don't even see in themselves, pulling that out of that person, mobilizing this tremendous talent, you know, coordinating these wonderful teams that end up doing all these things that you no longer have to do, which gives you the ability to focus on the things you really love to do. And in the process, you make a lot of money and you got unlimited free time. You know, people would be amazed if they learned how much time I spend on self-care every day. It's five, six hours a day minimum, long walks at the gym, stretching, you know, martial arts, reading, studying, spending time with my daughter. We walk every day together, you know, so it's just, you know, those are the important things in life. The money takes care of itself because I surround myself with incredible people. My job is to dream up the big things and lay it on the table 
And every single time they surpass expectations because I believe in them. And that's the other thing. I mean, so many of the things I do, and it's not toot my own horn, it's just contrary to conventional wisdom in business because the belief system is based on the idea that I'm the smart one. You know, I'm the guy with the degree from Harvard or the girl with the degree from Stanford. I know what I'm doing. We're going to listen to what I have to say and follow my mandate and everything's going to be copacetic. And then you got a bunch of inept people that sit there you know, anesthetized in your nonsense, your belief system based on the idea that you're the supreme being with all the answers. And they end up shutting up because they want to comply. And, you know, basically it's an obedient reward type of relationship, much like you find in academia. Well, I'll do my part. I'll get the good grade and everything's going to be fantastic. And, you know, we just don't operate like that. When I believe in people and give them the ability to operate without impunity, I have to do very little. I mean, quite honestly, I spend very little time uh, running this company. It runs itself because of the extraordinary people that run it for me. And, and, and sadly enough, that's just not the way it's done. And a lot of people would have a difficult time surrendering to that idea because mm -hmm. it's so inconsistent with our ego, which says, I got to be in charge. And I've heard some big influencers on social media, people we love and respect, you know, talk about this. Like, hey, I got to be involved in every aspect of the business. And I, I say to myself, that's, that's really sad. You know, uh, when you feel that way, I, I don't have to be involved in every aspect of the business because I have people that are far better doing it than I am. And I'd end up screwing it up, you know, by getting into the operations, by getting into the programming and the high level, because we do some very high level tech things. I don't know anything about that. I have no desire to know anything about that. You know, I just want to know the person that I hired to do that is as passionate about doing that as the things that I'm as passionate about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, there's so much to unpack in there. And, and obviously I think uh, when you, when you scale to a certain level, you have that luxury of stepping back or if you have the vision and the leadership because you've done the investing and hired the right people. Um, but, but let's, let's now take where you're at and step back. Um, one of the themes of our book that we talk a lot about is, is the who, right? And people will say, Oh, the why, the why, which is absolutely valuable. And um, how am I going to do this? That's valuable. And the, what am I going to do? But like for us, you know, what radically transformed our life was running into other people who've been able to create the kind of lifestyle we now have. And we just humbled ourselves at their feet and listened to them. And that radically transformed our life. <laughs> and then having a supportive community uh, and people want to be, Hey, I want to scale a big company or go a big, be really successful in entrepreneurship or meteorology or whatever, but then they don't hang out with anyone who actually is. Oh, hold on. Mm -hmm. the world. Yeah, exactly. And so you, <laughs> yeah, you obviously keyed in on that really early and that, that transformed really probably the course of your life that you took that time. And, and, and we've talked about this before. Like if you really want to get on someone's calendar, like go work for them for free and just provide a ton of value. And if they like you enough, they'll hire you because your value is so high. And if you're younger, there's so many things that you can do. Um, so can, can you maybe just give people some tips, maybe either practical or mindset wise on like how to get themselves immersed in the who and how to, how to attract the attention of a mentor and, and how to maybe surround yourself with a community or, or the importance of those things? You know, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. The beautiful thing I think about that today, you guys, is the fact that with social media, we can facilitate those introductions so much easier. Yeah. You know, um, back in the 80s, when I was doing this, we didn't have the luxury of reaching out on LinkedIn and connecting with amazing people like you. If you're a young people and you're in Wisconsin, here's two remarkable people right here you can reach out to. And I know they'll open their arms and, you know, steer you in the right direction. I have a young lady from India who's 21 years old, who's written to me every day for three months. She is persistent. She is a pit bull and she is determined and she is focused and I can see it and I can smell success on her a mile away. Yeah. So I've opened my heart to this person and I've steered her in the right direction. She's making amazing contacts. Just got a job last week because of a, a introduction I facilitated. Some young kid reached out to me on uh, Instagram from Nigeria uh, about a year ago. And he was taking pictures with a suit on, dirt schoolroom floor, wearing a nice watch. And I could tell this kid believes in this whole idea of success. He's looking the part, you yeah. know, and he reached out and he said, sir, can you help me? Um, a friend of mine, I've got a hundred dollars to my name and I want to invest it. And a buddy of mine wants me to invest in this. And I said, nope, I'm going to point you to something better. And so I pointed him to an investment that he opened up in his name, started, and he's already quadrupled that. 
uh, and then some. And so he reaches out to me. Thank you so much. I said, don't ever hand your money over to anybody ever again. You know, learn to do this stuff for yourself. You don't need a financial planner. Become well-versed at this stuff. I've seen so much advice, you guys, to deviate a bit, just on like the stock market, investing, hold the money on, you know, don't do this, do Bitcoin, do that. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can put yourself in a financial position where you can be stable and and diversifying your investments to such an extent that you can kind of um, insulate yourself from some of these tumultuous times that we've been through. And I've seen so many people react emotionally. And that's the problem. You know, people get so emotional about financial decisions and business decisions. And when you alleviate the need to be so emotionally invested in the outcome and you just say, you know what, this is a path I'm going down because I'm committed and I'm confident and I'm going to do what's required. And when you do what's required, you alienate yourself, Carrie, from, to answer your question, so many other people that just go through life like a herd and they just follow and they take advice from people and they just make decisions based on their emotional impulses. You know, that's why the wolf is my spirit animal because I so closely relate to that animal because the wolf will function as an alpha in a group and do what's required for the survival of the team. And if it has to, it will venture off into the wilderness and chase a moose down by itself for three months until that animal collapses and they finally get a meal. But they can do those things. So I'm like the lone wolf. I, I've always done what's required. I'm not interested in fraternizing with ordinary folks. And I know that sounds callous and abrasive, but you're just going to bring me down. I'm happy to give you stuff. I give gifts. You give gifts. We share what we have to offer. But if you want to surround yourself in my circle of friends, you got to be extraordinary. I'm sorry. You know, and that sounds very elitist maybe to some, and it might sound a little bit selective, but that's why I invited you in our group on LinkedIn, Carrie, because yeah. you have special qualities and you're welcome to come too, Craig. It's, it's about quality people that I know have something exceptional and you want to surround yourself with those people. And it's not that you don't give and reach out and help other people. We do that all the time. But as far as the super, super close circle of friends, that's got to be a group of people that challenge you intellectually, physically, emotionally, professionally, because like now, these are difficult times. You don't want to be surrounded by people that are taking the bait and going in whatever direction. Like this past year, it's been a blessing. I love it. And that doesn't sound normal. But to me, it's like, oh, yeah, we got to rise up. I got to work out in my house. What am I going to do? I'm going to go get $400 worth of equipment, pull-ups. I've been, I've been having the best workouts. I walk out in my garage with my shirt off. It's 32 degrees. My neighbors are looking at me like it's insane. It's like there's new challenges here. You know, there's a new opportunity to go. Where's the competition going to be weakest? I can't wait to dive in and take advantage of an opportunity. And, you know, that, that sounds brutal, but if you don't operate that way, then you're waiting for the government to hand you some kind of a donation. And with the donation, there's always something to be expected on the other side of that. So we have to be careful about what we wish for. But, um, well, and I love that you speak to just having a really high standard for your inner circle and who's influencing you. And yet you maintain that generosity and really that ripple effect of, I mean, those stories of the people that you're empowering internationally is, is really special and just goes so much to your character in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, I mean, we're hardcore about our association. We've got a pretty strong filter, <laughs> um, especially when we want to continue leveling up and right. take our game to the next level. We have to access people who yeah. think differently and who are, we're further along than us. So. Yeah, it, it's interesting because as soon as we hang out with someone like you, we feel the pull. But if we hang out with our peers or we hang out with people who are maybe behind, it's like all of a sudden you feel like you're a big deal or you feel like almost you're, you're already there. But as soon as you hang out with somebody who's at the next level, it creates that pull. And I think we get a lot of joy out of like making that move and like feeling that pull and inspiring to be better. Uh, and, 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 and there's a danger in that too, guys. And I, you know, just want to preface this with the idea that, you know, this doesn't suggest that we don't, you know, we're not kind, we're not loving, we're not open to conversations with people, words of encouragement. I do that all day long. I'm at the gym pumping people up. I build everybody up, but I'll give you an example. A kid heard my podcast, came up to me while I was working out and that's sacred time for me. It's not playtime. I'm not at the gym to socialize. And, you know, that's not that time for me. So I go at times when it's not busy for the purpose 
purpose of diving into the deep water. I don't want to be distracted. And so this person took the liberty to, hey, follow me around, was starting to interfere with my workouts. And I had to take them aside and say, Jeff, you know, can I tell you something? Um, this is my time. I have an hour to myself and I appreciate your enthusiasm for what I'm doing. But from this day forward, this is done. Okay. If you'd like to pay, pay me for an hour of consultation, we can do that, you know, but, but, you know, please don't interfere with my focus here at the gym anymore. And uh, if you want to listen to the podcast, all the gifts I'm offering, please take it, run with it. But what you're attempting to do is intercede into my personal time and it's interfering with my workout. That seems harsh and it seems hurtful, but it's honest. Mm -hmm. And that's what feedback is. And that's part of the honesty of saying no and setting boundaries and stuff that I think a lot of people don't understand. And I have no trouble doing that. If I offend somebody and I have one lot less podcast listener, I'm okay with that because I know the consequence of uh, acquiescing with my boundaries. Because on the other side of that is like a stray pet I just took in. Now they're going to be wandering all over the place. Next thing you know, they'll show up at my doorstep peering in my window at 2 a.m. So I got to be, you know, I got to be careful about that stuff. And so, you know, these are the tough decisions, getting back to what you said, Carrie, that we have to make in life. Because you have to decide how bad do you really want to succeed? Do you want to succeed bad enough to let go of the misfits that are holding you down? that are wasting all their time arguing on social media and, and raising hell and causing problems? Or do you want to be different and say, there's nothing I can do about this. And even if these people somehow get into power and suggest to make my life so much better, do you think it's really going to get that much better? It isn't. I got news for you. The only way it's going to get better is if you commission your own commitment to yourself and get serious about changing your life. I mentor African-American boys I have for 30 years. One of my all-stars is now the principal at the number one wrestling school in the country. And he's got the most winningest wrestling record in the United States. They've won, won 18 state titles since, since this young man has the best. He came from South Indiana or from South Chicago northern indiana at the time when he grew up most violent city in america had six brothers all dead from gang violence bullets to the head he's the wow. only one that survived so when people come to me like that when i met him years ago and he said i want to be successful i said i know you do i can see it in you so here's what we're going to do we're going to ignore the rhetoric and all the empty promises and the political accolades and all that crap we're going to take full responsibility for our life. And we're going to use our imagination to open up opportunities because they're there for you. And I'll steer you in the right direction. Now he's got a PhD, you guys. He's got a PhD. And he is one of the smartest people I know and one of the most gifted coaches I've ever met. So when people tell me I can't get to where I want to be until somebody gives me some advantage that I desperately need to have, I don't buy it. I don't buy it because I believe in people and I believe in their ability to change their life. And I believe in anybody's desire. I, I just had this conversation with a guy the other day. He goes, you seem so smart. I said, you know, what? I'm really not. I did okay in school. I got to tell you a story about when I was in um, high school. Okay. And my kids and I went out to my parents' house when they were both alive. We were digging through a box of memorabilia that my mom said, Hey, you got to take this stuff and bring it back home. It's cluttering things up. So there was report cards and trophies and all that stuff in there. And I'd been lecturing my kids. They're both in high school about guys got to get good grades. You got to focus and do well in school. It's not about the grades. It's about the commitment to doing something you really don't want to do in order to gain the discipline necessary to do things in life that will help propel you to where you want to be. And so I was kind of giving them the lecture on the grades. And so we're going through the box of memorabilia. And all of a sudden, my son pulls out my report cards from high school. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, C's and D's. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, dude, you're the dumbest human being on the planet. <laughs> and I fell over backwards. We started laughing. And my point is that, you know, these limitations we put on ourselves that somehow you got to fit and fall in line with these things. So I, I don't buy all this stuff. I don't like the rhetoric of limitations. I like the you know, the rhetoric of possibilities where, you know, people realize that, man, I can go off and do amazing things. And uh, I don't need anybody's permission. I don't need anybody's blessing. And I don't need anybody's help, really, if I absolutely, if it comes down to that. And uh, to I don't the <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't get me started. You guys know better than to bring me on the show and get me all energized. I, I mean, as you can tell, I kind of like this subject. 
Yeah. Well, we 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 feel the same. We've had opportunity to do a lot of public speaking the last few years, and it's like once you get going and you really get energized and passionate about helping other people, it just oozes out of you, and that's just so so clear with you, Steve. So we appreciate that. Um, quick tip as we start to wind down here for um, maybe your first year self or budding entrepreneurs. I mean, you've given a lot of, of tips already. There's a lot, a lot of takeaways. Uh, but like when you think about, you know, talking to your first year self, what would maybe you do different or what, what kind of advice would you give to yourself or maybe someone else who's just getting in the game and, and uh, you can maybe help avoid some, some minefields or mines in the field? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a learning process, and I think the most important thing is you have to give yourself some grace and appreciate that you know this is a process. It's not an easy one. We all know the uh, vicissitudes of failure associated with running a business, and so if you focus on that and get discouraged by that, I bring those things up simply because I want people to have a realistic assessment of how serious and sincere they are. You guys are remarkable, in my opinion, because it's rare when you find a loving, happy, healthy, wonderful couple that's committed to that aspect of their life and also committed to the successful business. And I've uh, conferred with plenty of people over the years that come to me as a married couple or a couple that's together a partnership. And they say, Hey, Steve, um, you know, we want to do this. We want to have this business together. And I oftentimes will say, what do you value more? You know, the, the relationship or do you value the aspirations to be successful in business? Because one of those is hard enough let alone both of those simultaneously. And I know very few couples that pull it off like you guys do. So if you're looking for some mentors that, you know, are, are clicking on cylinders and you know, my anatomy of success for tenets of equanimity, it's healthy, yeah. intimate relationships. And you guys are doing that, your mm-hmm. health, you're doing that, you're doing your business, your family, your connection, you're clicking on all those cylinders. And I would argue, I don't know, I can't speak to this, but I would bet on a level from one to 10, you know, your level of happiness daily is probably about an eight, eight and a half, maybe a nine, right? I had to guess. Yeah, we feel pretty. We feel very blessed. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's course, nothing we, we should be ashamed about. We still about. have our disagreements, but uh, but we do. Feel really of course, blessed. you do, because you're normal, and that's to be expected. Yeah. I mean, hardest thing you'll ever do is be with another person and make it work for a long time. It's not <laughs> easy. Mm-hmm. True. True. No. Well, we appreciate all the thought process. I love how you talked about just the deeper ownership and the deeper responsibility. I think that really cuts straight to the heart of entrepreneurship, whether you're side hustling or you've launched more of a full-blown front hustle. So I think there's just a lot for us to really unpack as we as we coach a lot of people who are in that position too, and just making sure that people understand. I mean, we're big proponents of being really candid up front with people on the expectations and the mindset because It's interesting with social media, sometimes I think we see a lot of glamour and glitz and not enough of the raw, uncut, you know, work ethics and hustle. And I talk a lot about enjoying the grind. You've you've heard me say that before, Steve. And I I wonder if you can just speak to, I mean, you clearly have a badass work ethic, but I, I also very much sense like deeper joy and and happiness and being in the pursuit from you, which I think is so incredible and so important. And I wonder if you can just speak to that a little bit of like, how did you create that in your life? Was that just how you are? Or is that something you've worked on as an entrepreneur to work so hard and be so focused and help so many people and yet create a lot of success and be happy through the process? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question, Carrie. And when I started this personal mission a few years ago, back when my father passed away and he started writing books and podcasting and doing social media, I'd never done any of that. So I was at a point in life where I thought, you know, I'm going to ride off into the sunset. sunset. My business runs the itself pretty much. And, you know, I can sit in the Maldives for three months out of the year and relax and have a good time or maybe be less selfish and give back and try to help other people achieve the same dream that I did. And once I tapped into that, I realized, yeah, this is part of a higher calling. So my whole life has just been a series of decisions like that. When I first started my business, I was 21. That's awfully young. So you can imagine with my demeanor, which is toned down considerably (laughs) from when I was 21. I mean, I was a raging lunatic. I mean, like an entrepreneurial lunatic. You know, you couldn't live up to my high expectations. I was on the air and I took what I did very seriously. So to hire people and anytime they'd screw up, I'd get upset. You know, I was not easy to work for, you know, and I chewed up employees like disposable razors. 
back in the day. Because so a lot of the stuff that I talk about, guys, and we don't get to this much on social media, I had to learn the hard way. That's why I'm so passionate about the things I speak about today, because it's been a process to come from that person at that age, which is to be expected, to where I'm at today, where my op- the way I operate with people is just very different, you know, and so those are lessons that I learned and I've practiced. So I know the efficacy of those things. And um, so my whole journey has just been, I I love what I do. I mean, when you start off at such an early age and during your first year become profitable and you've been profitable every, I mean, we kind of defy all the rules of entrepreneurship, you know, when people make this sound like it's so hard and you got to fail all the time to succeed. I mean, I just don't buy into that. I don't, you know, I have a preferred way of doing, you know, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to have some setbacks, but I really prefer to avoid problems. Like my brother, who was my best friend, died of alcohol and drug related issues. And I watched him self-destruct. And I told myself from an early age, you know what? I don't see any real positive benefits to drinking or to doing drugs. So guess what? I'm not doing that. I'm going to go down the healthy path. And I started that at 15, like a fanatic. You know, and to this day, I work out like a fanatic. I have people that come up to me at the gym and say, dude, how old are you? There's no way anybody your age can do this stuff that you're doing, deadlifts and, you know, inverted body stuff. And and I love that because that's inspirational for people. So all along the journey, it's always about energizing other people. And when you hire people and watch them succeed, and I think too many people just make it about them. And when everything's about you, the world becomes a really shallow, sad place. But when you live to help other people, like when I know there's a crisis coming like this one we've been in for the past year, I amplify my intensity because I know my responsibilities and the burden are so severe. It's like I got to perform at a high level because these people are counting on me. And so one of my favorite quotes that I dreamed up years ago was, you know, good leaders don't inflict pain, they endure it. And that whole is that, that, that that's about the idea that, you know, we don't have to announce what we're doing and celebrate what we're doing. We just got to do it. We got to do what's required. And we do it in a way that doesn't bring everybody else down because they need to stay confident. They need to know that the ship's going in the right direction. And the captain is at half a bottle into a fifth of gin ready to run up on the sandbar. So composure and leadership roles is a whole nother topic i'd love to discuss <laughs> yeah I, we have about eight more questions for you I, I think we've, we've, we've got to wind it down just for sake of time and, and to respect yours of course but um leaders uh don't inflict uh pain they endure it i love that that's really beautiful i, I think that that's definitely a great way for us all to think about how we can evolve to the next level um so Steve, thank you um, so much for taking even just this amount of time. I'm glad we didn't try to get you at the gym and we got you while you were in your <laughs> office. I, I don't think that I would want that uh, that back top inside of room in the, in the locker. So we appreciate um, your time and your energy and your enthusiasm and, and really your passion for life. I mean, you can just feel it. And so um, that is is what is inspiring for us. And, and I think anyone we run into, we're, we're aspiring to, to be able to emulate that. So Thank you so much. One of the big reasons we wrote the book is and, and have started the podcast is really just a chance to elevate. And, and we see so many people getting distracted by a lot of the material success, which I would love to go deeper with you on your equanimity. I just started meditating more in this last year. And I, I think that there's so much to uncover there. Um, but we just really feel like it is about helping people get closer to like what matters most. And I feel like you really have, have epitomized that and used entrepreneurship and a side hustle ultimately to fuel uh, your, your very blessed life. So thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thanks a lot, guys. And Steve, what's the best way for people to connect with you and follow your work? You know, I think probably go to weatherology.com uh, and then grab the Weatherology mobile app. Oh, it's amazing. And, uh, it's and then stop sexy by. It's looking. It's for a weather app. Holy cow. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the stuff we plan to do with that, I'll just kind of, it's the only audio weather app in the world. Our patent is real voices translating text in real time. So the implications, as you guys know, in vehicles and at home and stuff is unbelievable. So lots of exciting things happening with the technology. But, um, and then you can find me under the About Us and you can find the book and the podcast and at the top of the page links to LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. And I hope you follow along. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate it. I know the listeners will be very full after today's episode, and we hope everybody enjoys the grind and has a beautiful rest of the day. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, guys. 
Thanks for listening to today's episode. Please subscribe and leave a review and be sure to visit tandemconsulting.co backslash talks.